What's up, world? It's Ryan Banta coming at you with a very different conversation than I normally have as a discussion point. Um, today, I'm going to talk about my thoughts on how to save public education. Um, might be controversial as a teacher. I hope not. I hope this conversation is received the way it should be, which is just opportunities for change in a positive way and things that I think we can do if we're willing to be risk takers and demand more from ourselves as the teachers, as the people who are the most um, tied into this, the stakeholders. Um, I think we can have a conversation and it can be a powerful one that um, I hope that many of you guys understand where I'm coming from. So we got a lot of different things to talk about. Uh, I just listened to probably one of the best podcasts I've ever I've ever listened to um, from a gentleman on on believe it or not Joe Rogan's podcast about just life and the world and how to look at the world and how to look at happiness and how to get successful. And I've been thinking about this a lot. And um, this is not an indictment of my school or my particular place of employment by any means. But I think it's a thing that everyone could probably benefit from a number of these ideas. And um, these are things that I think we could do nationally and system-wide to be able to improve the experience of the young people that we're with. Uh, I do have some very big fears based on, you know, where education is going and social media and the dangers of that, even though here I am on social media uh, promoting some of these ideas. The first one is continued education. And I think People get into continued education, they think of the natural progression from, you know, hopefully preschool, kindergarten, elementary school, middle school, junior high, then in the high school, then either a trade school, a junior college, college, graduate school, you know, master's doctorate. And they think of it like that. But in the problem that we have is that we are living on a system where we believe that the job we're going to have now, the job that I have now as an educator, is going to be the job that I'm going to be doing decades from now. Because of technology and because of automation and because of the rate and speed in which life is changing for all of us, we have to be a little bit more forward thinking on how to handle potentially upcoming challenges or even opportunities. So one of the ideas, and this isn't mine, but it just this has kind of got my whole process thinking from the the, the podcast that just happened with uh, Naval is the guy's name, Genius. Um, he talked about having every 10 years that we as a society allow everyone, everyone to go back to a year of college or tech school or trade school to re-educate ourselves. So that you don't get into a situation where someone who is used to having a job forever in, in a particular field or particular career and then have that career ended and it no longer exists. So like the automization of trucks that could potentially remove all the truck driving employees that we could have. Well, what are they to do? And one of the things that people talked about is well, learn to code or learn to do this. Well, how do you do that? If there isn't an opportunity for you to financially step away from what you were doing and getting a new potential education. And what he suggested was every 10 years, you have an opportunity to step away, maintain your salary, maintain your job, a year long of unemployment insurance with keeping your, your education the way it is. You get to do it once every 10 years um, and then go back and get reeducated in whatever you needed to do so that you don't have to sacrifice your entire financial well-being for happiness, for productivity, or to be put in a situation where you're no longer a productive individual. Because even though people get older and they say, well, you lose opportunities because of neural pruning to learn a new language, to learn a new skill, to learn something new, that may or may not be entirely true. I'm not a uh, neuroscientist by any means, but I think that having that as an option is noble to be able to let people go back every 10 years and say, you know what? I don't want to be a salesman of flooring anymore. You know, I've always wanted to write music. I've always wanted to become a graphic designer. I don't want to work this middle management job where I'm just typing in numbers into a spreadsheet. You know, I've wanted to do marketing. I've wanted to do digital design. And every 10 years, you would get an opportunity to do that so that you don't sacrifice a 40-year uh, of 40 years of your life 
waiting till retirement eventually comes and you're old and you're unhappy. Having a job, having a life of purpose, having a job of meaning is incredibly important to the longevity of somebody's life and to the happiness of somebody's life. And being able to go through those changes and to make those turns and to make those changes over life is really, really important. How many people said, you know, I'd really love to be a teacher. I'd love to get an education. Well, darn it, we need people that want to do that, that have a desire to do that. And if it means that the one thing that's keeping them from doing it is going to school for four years straight and not being able to get paid and having to pay somebody when you're doing your student teaching um, and not be able to be employable, well, that's crazy. You know, we need people, especially older people who are in upper echelons of experience in life who probably have practical experience in what they would like to teach. We need to make it easier for those people to come join us. That is an incredibly important way to save public education is through continued public education. Being able to do that and to not feel that you're going to put your fi- your family on the street and you're going to be in the poorhouse because you want to take a year of learning how to become a graphic designer, learning how to become a teacher, learning how to become, um, I don't know, public security of some sort, you know, and having a real education in those things. Being able to do that allows a society to be productive longer in the upper ages of employment. So I think that was an amazing idea that he presented. I loved it. I thought it was awesome. And I think it's something that we should continue to do. The other thing that needs to stop happening, and we've seen articles and articles and articles on this in many different education sites, is having a stigma about tech school. When I was in high school, I I know there was probably tech school, but most of the tech type classes, so AutoCAD, electrical work, carpentry, um, mechanic work on cars, all of that stuff was in-house. We didn't move that and shop that off of campus to another facility. Because first of all, that makes it really inconvenient for you to be a part of the community that you've been a part of until that point. A little kid, if they're lucky, and I know this isn't for everybody, but if they're lucky, they've gone all the way through this public education system all the way into high school. And then because they have an interest in learning how to do cosmetology, to become a a carpenter, an electrician, auto mechanic, now they have to go off campus. A four-year college is not necessarily the educational path for everyone. Tech and those tech type of jobs, if those weren't around for my friends when I was in high school, many of my friends would be unemployable. And they would be reliant upon governmental assistance and tax dollars and maybe would not have a career. Because we've stigma those things to say, well, you're, you're a little, yeah, you can't handle traditional school, so we're going to put you over here. It should be part of traditional school. And more importantly, when it comes to adulting, we should offer up those opportunities so that more and more people know how to do some of the basic things. If you know how to hang drywall, if you know how to how to, to make a frame for a house, if you know how to run electricity, you're going to save yourself so much more money in the future and you will always have a skill that's employable. Because the reality is, even if they automize a whole bunch of different types of jobs with computers and machines and, and all that nonsense, you're still going to need a plumber to come into your 100-year-old house and remove plumbing. You're still gonna need somebody to rewire your house. It's not gonna be able to be done by a robot, okay? And I know some people say, oh, that's not true. I'm telling you, it's not gonna happen. So you have to have people with those skill sets and those jobs, and they shouldn't feel like they have to go somewhere else to get those skill sets and to get those jobs. You know, they shouldn't have to go off campus. That should be a part of education. By separating it, it's just like back in the day when we had racial separations of school and that oxymoronic term of separate but equal, which is total crap, okay? That was ridiculous, and we all knew that, and we knew that that separate meant that it wasn't equal. And so by putting this in another building, I think is doing us a disservice, no matter if it's financially more viable for the, for the school districts to cost or, or whatever. Those classes need to come back inside the buildings. Every high school should have all of those classes offered for kids so that they, if they so choose, don't want to go to a four-year university and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars 
on a degree that may or may not bear fruit, they can at least have the skill sets in the interim to be able to pay for that school or to pay for their um, life while they're searching for a job for that four-year degree that they got. It just makes so much sense. So we have to end the stigma of tech classes and tech schools. The other thing that we need to do, we used to live in a world where parents and, and kids understood this idea of gratitude. Gratitude where they would say, thank you for teaching me. You were a great teacher. You know, bring the teacher an apple, that old school kind of idea. We used to do a lot of that back in the day, or at least that's what people said happened. But whether it's true or not, we are lacking in gratitude and respect and understanding. A long time ago, um, the kid messed up. Well, what did you do, kid? Now, kid messes up. Well, what did the teacher not do? What did the teacher not understand? What did the teacher not um, prepare? How did they not follow the plan or this or that? And guess what? There are bad teachers that definitely should not be teaching. Well, that's a whole nother conversation. But what about when teachers and kids are doing the right thing? We need to drop gratitude bombs on people. Big element of positive psychology is that if you share gratitude more than, you know, or complimenting somebody or offering your time or your service or volunteer, does way more for the person who does it, okay, over a longer period of time than just giving money away for that. So gratitude is really important, and it should go two ways. One of the most important things that we did at Parkway Central, which I, I really would like us to see do in a more of a formal thing, is that basically once every year in an ACK lab, all of the kids, which is a study hall in our building, all the kids would write two to three teachers that they're thankful for having or faculty members that they really appreciate. And then all of that would get typed up, and then at the end of the year, a big list of all these compliments from all these students would then go to the teachers. We don't do that in a formal capacity anymore in my school district, but I think we should go back to that. It's very important to do. Why? Because every teacher needs to be told once in a while that they're doing a great job. Because the reality is, as an educator, you're in a classroom with 20 to 30 kids with no other adult seeing what you're doing. And so the only thing that any other adult knows about you or you know about the kids is what's happening in that classroom. And what I was always amazed by is when we would get this list of all these positive things that um, these kids would say, um, to me, I, there would always be kids on the list that I was like, I didn't know that kid liked me. I thought that kid didn't like this class. I thought this kid didn't appreciate me. And what it does is it creates a thicker and a more intense and positive relationship because now that door has been open for that kid and for you to have an, hey, I really liked your class. I really thought you were great. Now, as much as I want that to come back for us as educators, because I actually think of that as my, I used to think of that as my evaluation. And my job every year was I wanted more and more kids to write me down as one of these educators that really influenced them and they appreciated for it because I felt like I was making a bigger impact the more kids I had that would write their gratitude for the class and how much they enjoyed it. And what was really humbling and awesome for me is when kids would say, I never liked history, I used to hate it, but Mr. Banta teaches it in a unique way, he's funny, I enjoy his class, I love coming to his class. That's the biggest compliments as an educator we can get. Now. That's great that we used to do that, and I want us to do that again in our building. But what else can happen is we can do the same thing for the kids. We should do the same thing. We should say to the kids, hey, I really, really appreciate you. You're an amazing student. I really enjoyed having you in class. This project that you did was fantastic. And then those notes from those teachers get handed out to those kids in class you know, or sent to them as part of their, uh, their report card. And it gets sent home to their parents, you know. That is really important, and that should be mandated. So that gratitude is going both ways. And I know that some of us in some schools and some programs do it, but it should be done at every school. Every school should have that. Because then what you're doing is you're building a sense of family, you're building a sense of community, and you get to see all these wonderful people and all these great things that are going on. You know, I think that um, the principal, sh every grade level principal should meet with every student that's in their grade 
It should be part of their daily routine that they meet four or five kids, you know, whatever, for the first couple of months of school and just talk to them about their experience and what they think and how they think things are going and how things could be improved and, and all this. That should be part of the job. And the problem is, as a principal or an administrator, a lot of times you're just dealing with problems. You're dealing with parents who aren't very happy. You're dealing with kids who are upset or maybe have misbehaved. And now this gives you an opportunity to not just talk to the high achieving kids, which you get an opportunity to interact with. And then the kids are really driving you crazy. You get to get all of the kids and talk to them and share those experiences and have that. I think that's super important. Very, very important. I think it should go both ways you know gratitude from the kids to the teachers because it was awesome and it was a way to evaluate our education and then we as the teachers should show our gratitude to students too and I know that we have some awards and things that we do but I think every teacher should be mandated to do that and if you want to get really really great you know in a really high end is make sure that every kid gets something from someone and I know you're like, oh, everybody gets a trophy. Doesn't matter. If a teacher can genuinely say something really sweet and wonderful about a kid, even the kid that struggles the most, that kid now knows that there's one person in the building that values them. Gratitude. Both ways. Super important. Another thing. We're moving to screens. I'm talking to you on a screen right now. There have been lots of longitudinal studies about the success rate academically screens versus paper typing versus writing and the kids that we're doing these studies on have lived in a world where screens have been part of their existence since they were born and even though these kids have had screens as part of their educational existence since they were born paper and books still resonate more in terms of retention and academic success. And even more importantly, being in the room with the educator themselves and building a relationship and having to interact with other people in a room and the educator, pressing the flesh, shaking their hand, seeing them, that is critical because it builds a community it builds togetherness. It, it helps reduce the feelings of isolation and, and being alone. And that's not going to fix all the problems. But as we continue to feel like we want to move to more computers, more screen time, less paper textbooks because it's cheaper, you know, um, having online classes because me as an educator, I could go and teach an online class and teach hundreds of people because it's more efficient. Well, sometimes being more efficient isn't more valuable, isn't better for the human condition. We as humans desire community. We desire structure. We desire togetherness. We do. But when we put those screens up, it literally creates problems. We're looking at this bright television, this bright screen on the computer, and no matter how much we want to lock things down or put firewalls up and stuff like that. A kid's got a computer in front of them and they've got internet access. They can go any direction they want to go. And you as the educator, if you're moving and working around the room, instead of staring at your computer and 50 screens and, you know, don't look at that, don't look at that, don't look at that. We all know that the better education is being with the kids, that distance being closed down and interacting with them. Think about it. The most productive that we can get is when we're within eight meters of each other. If we're behind a screen, we could be 800 miles away from each other. And the interaction is way dropped off. The productivity is way dropped off. You've got so many other things you could be doing and looking at and, and, and researching or playing video games or watching YouTube videos. Kids desire structure, they need structure. And when you open up the world to them, um, that's not always the best. It takes away from the concentrated effort that you're trying to put forth, which would ever be the content material of that particular class. And then losing the ability to write and losing the ability to write in cursive. Think about this. All our oldest documents, all of our founding fathers, they wrote in cursive. So when people 100 years from now want to reinterpret what the founding fathers said, they're not going to be able to read it or they may not understand it because they've, there's no 
nobody knows cursive. Nobody knows how to write it. And nobody knows how to interpret it. That's kind of dangerous. And so I feel like paper and writing things down and having textbooks, the data has proven longitudinal studies that instead of doing less of paper, less of textbooks, we should be doing more of it. Because everything else in education, in their world, they're doing screen time. And you're like, but wait, that's the world they're going to have. That's the job they're going to have. That's the career they're going to have. They're going to be in front of a screen. Yeah, you're right. But they're also getting a lot of education on screen time and how to access that technology and move those materials and do those goods anyway. And that's why we have specific tech classes that allow students to then work through those materials and those technologies and those mediums. But they also need to take a break from that lit screen and work with educational material in a different way to stimulate their brain in a different way to enhance their neural network even bigger. So paper and flesh, be in the flesh, work with paper, get away from the glowing screen. Very important. Number five, everyone should have to do PE for four years. PE should be a mandatory four year class. But the caveat is not everyone gets an A in PE. You know, I remember I had this conversation before. If you're a really, really good athlete and you're really healthy and you make improvements through your PE class and we can set up targets and measurements to improve you, then that allows you to improve your grade. You know, you participate, you're competitive. Oh, well, I'm not an athlete. I was born slow or I was, I'm not tall or I'm not, you know, this or that. Okay. So I was born with a disability of how to write. I've got dysgraphia. So English was pretty tough for me. I didn't get an A just by showing up and writing. It's the same thing for PE. PE is important. Being physically healthy is so important. More important than ever. Why? Because kids don't get up and move around. They're less and less active than they've ever been. They spend more and more time isolated in an air-conditioned environment and behind a, gl uh, a glowing screen. We need more PE to make up the difference. It's more important than ever to make up the difference for physical health, to force those kids to get up and move. And that means you're dressing out. That means you have a PE uniform. You're not wearing jorts and flip-flops and just being present at PE and we're gonna give you an A. If you can't run under a 10 minute mile, you don't get an A. You at least don't get 100%. You know, people are like, oh, that's not fair. It's, oh, it's, no, it, life is not fair. And you gotta get in shape. There are bare minimums that everyone should be required to hit in order for them to be physically healthy, especially if we're moving to a universal healthcare system where we are gonna provide healthcare for everybody else, don't we want everyone else to be more physically healthy so that that system is cheaper? I think we all know the answer to that. And we also know that there's an obesity epidemic in this country. If you go outside this country, the first thing that will strike you is how skinny everyone else is. And by no means am I a picture of health. You know, at 40 years old, but all the way through until my early 30s, I was very physically fit because I spent an entire life participating in physical activities and lifting weights and playing football and soccer and basketball and running track and playing rugby after college. These are all things that I did, you know, that I just did on my own, but we're past that now. Everybody wants to be in front of the screen, in air conditioning, isolated, not being forced to interact or communicate with anybody else. It's important to struggle together physically. That's important. And so we need more PE where not everybody gets A's just by showing up. It should be held to the same standards of every other class, even classes like art and choir. Part of your grade is based on performance. So should PE. And I think that's important to get us in the right mindset. And PE should not be a class that's just based off of, um, you know, you show up and you get a grade, of course, but also more importantly, like, you know, there should be some way for you to improve and to show that growth and all that kind of stuff. And it shouldn't be where the kids can game it and say, okay, I'm going to walk the mile. And then after I'm done walking the mile, then I'll run half of it and I'll improve enough to where I get my credits. That shouldn't be the case. Okay. You shouldn't get a grade 
until you can do that. And people are like, well, a mile makes people feel bad. Okay? So we're going to do a pacer test because we don't feel as bad. Okay? Well, I felt really bad when I bombed a chemistry test because I'm not a good math student. And so the worst science I ever had was chemistry because it required so much math. Okay? So it sucked. I struggled. I had to work harder. I had to earn a B. Earn a B. But I'll tell you this. I very much remember that class way more than pretty much all of my other classes because I actually earned that grade. And even though it was hard for me, I earned it and I worked for it. I wasn't just given it. So that's really important. Okay. Next thing, number six. Everybody talks about how we need more minority teachers. Only 2%, I think, of teachers are black men. How is that possible? Now, I know all of us are going to go down all this, oh, well, there's this and that, and they don't choose to do this, and blah, 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 blah. I don't care. We all know that we need to have more minority teachers. So what's the strategy? Where is the strategy for minority hires? I teach at a school where my school is 16% African American and 13% Asian. We have a few African American women teachers, which is more common if you ask you know, did national studies, that's more common than having a black male teacher in the high school level, okay? Same thing with Asian teachers. We don't have a lot of Asian teachers either from India or Southeast Asia. We don't have many. But yet our school is very predominantly those particular groups. And 30 plus percent of our school is that. And we're nowhere near that in terms of who we have in our building. So what would I suggest? Well, and for Parkway or for wherever you know you, you teach, there are schools that are historical black universities that all have teacher education curriculum and develop and make teachers. If it was up to me, I'd go out and I'd make sure that whoever was the top of the class teacher coming out of one of those historical black colleges, especially men, I would have a special scholarship pipeline job set up for them that it was a guarantee that once there was a job available and they were the top person in their class, that we would find a job for them in our school district. Period. You know, and people say, oh, well, that's, you know, uh, you know, mandatory and you're forcing these things. Yeah, I'm forcing a lot of stuff here. No doubt about it. Because in order to fix things, you're going to have to force some things. And some of those things are going to have to be demanded. Now, that doesn't mean if the person can't do their job, they get to keep their job. We're talking about hiring the best in those classes from those buildings that are there and getting them in front of our students who desperately need it. And why is that so important? Well, it's incredibly important. I've talked about this with uh, college coaching in the past, that having more women coaches is important. Why? So that other women athletes, young ladies, get to see that, hey, I could be a coach one day. I'd like to do that. And at the very least, what's the thing that's going to come out of that? You're going to have more girl athletes continue to do sports because they envision they can see a person that's been there where they've been and are now doing something that they want to do. It's the same thing for black young men. If they don't see black male teachers in a building that they go to for their entire educational existence, it's very hard to sell the idea that you can also become a black male teacher. So you need to have a pipeline. For Parkway, for St. Louis, let's go to Harris Stowe and go get those kids that are young men and women who are graduating college and let's get them jobs in our school district and eventually have a position for them as teachers retire to get them in. Be more intentional and aggressive. Doesn't mean you can't hire people of other colors and other genders and, and all that stuff. I'm not saying that. But you can be more intentional and more aggressive in getting people into your building that represent the kids that you have in your building. We don't have a lot of teachers from Asia as well. Probably need a few more people that look like the kids you teach the kids you educate. And it's not a simple solution. It's not easy. But you need to work towards that. Equity, not equality. Equity, giving people opportunities, get, putting them in a position to, to make a decision to be a part of our community. I think that's important. All right, number seven. You don't ever feel a part of a community unless you are a part of the community. What do I mean by that? 
every school, every high school has tons and tons and tons of extracurricular activities that they do. But participation in extracurricular activities nationally has been going down. It's definitely going down in our building in terms of the, it's like the same kids do all the stuff. I believe that every school upon graduation, you should have to participate in at least a semester's worth of time in an extracurricular activity. You have to do at least one semester. Now that can be a sport, that can be drama, one acts, that can be the, the gamers club, whatever extracurricular activities that our school district chooses to offer are all worthy enough for this being something that a kid should be a part of for a semester. So if grades are dependent, like, hey, I can't play football anymore because my grades aren't good, okay. But there are many other extracurricular activities that kids should be a part of. It should be part of the process in which to graduate. And people say, well, that's unfair to force kids to do that. What if a kid needs a job? Okay. But does a kid need a job their first semester of their freshman year before they're 16 years old? Probably not. But the more that you're a part of something that's bigger than you, the more you're a part of wearing your school colors and part of that community and representing your community, the more likely you're going to feel a part of it, the more likely you're going to enjoy it, and the more likely those memories are going to be good memories, and the more likely you're going to continue to participate in that activity, the more likely you're going to show up to school, the more likely your grades are going to be better. So why would we not force that? Well, we can't force kids to. We force kids to do all sorts of stuff. We force kids to take many years of foreign language. We force kids to take three to four years of math, three to four years of science. So why wouldn't you force the thing that actually makes their life the most pleasant and happy and enjoyable by getting to choose a program that they want to be a part of that's a part of their school, that's fun, and you give them an instant friend circle in which to of equal mind and equal enjoyment and, and, and love to do the things that they love to do too. And now they have this little tribe of kids that they feel more a part of. They're not so isolated anymore. They're not going straight home and getting on the computer and being by themselves. They're forced to interact. They're forced to be a part of a community. And let's be honest, guys. If we're going to still have kids come to us and to be a part of education and not be educated by one person behind a computer screen for a thousand people, we have got to offer them a unique experience that makes their life better. Yes, it means more time. Yes, it could mean more of a commitment. But one semester. You know, we used to do graduate uh, like community service hours for government. That was part of our, and it was a big ordeal and it was a big problem and hard to manage and unwieldy. But sometimes young kids don't understand that idea of service yet. But they definitely understand that, hey, I like this. I want to be a part of this. This brings me joy. This brings me pleasure. I feel a more a part of this group. I want to stick around. I want to continue to do this. This represents me. I'm a part of the color guard. I am the color guard. I'm not just Ryan Banta or, or whoever. You know, that's really powerful stuff. Why shouldn't we force that? Because guess what? I think it's like 70% of people participate in athletics and then they get into high school and they don't, you know, most of them don't do it anymore. It's no longer fun. Okay. Why isn't it fun? We can get into that conversation. We can have that talk, but there's many, many things in addition to athletics that you can do that are extracurricular, that are fun, that bring joy, that are pleasurable, you know, that make you happy. I believe that every kid should be forced to do a semester's worth of activity in an extracurricular be it a sport, be it a performance group, be it a club. They need to be more a part of the community, and we should force that. And then guess what? Those kids are going to enjoy it, and it's going to be part of their experience. And a lot of private schools do that. There are private schools that force it, and they got huge, massive teams, and there's tons of school pride. Oh, imagine that. They got a lot more school pride because I'm actually a part of this. This is me. I represent this. This is my community. This is my team, my group, my one act, my performance my art gallery, all of a sudden it becomes something bigger than you. You become part of the community. Another thing, mandatory positive psychology class. We have to take finance, to take uh, facts, uh, family, consumer science. We have to take foreign language. We have to take English. We have to take science. I think that everyone should be forced to take a positive psychology class. Why? Because we live in a primordial soup 
of negativity. When psychology changed, originally psychology was based on positive psychology. And the whole study of psychology was based on high achievers, not what was wrong with us, not our neurosis, not our stuff that, that we struggle with, but instead the things that make us resilient, the things that make us powerful, the things that great high achieving people have in common. That's what used to be studied in psychology. And I'm not saying we shouldn't study all the other stuff in psychology. Absolutely not. That should be studied without a doubt. But positive psychology frames the world for these kids so much better in terms of how to change the brain and how we look at the world, how we attack the world differently, how we positive self-talk, what's right about us, what's genuinely good about us, why should you have self-worth? And here's the reasons, and here's how you get yourself in a better place so that you can be more resilient, more robust, have more grit. All of those things should be talked about in a classroom setting. What could be more important than improving the mindset of young people? Positive psychology should be a mandatory class for every high school student across the United States. We spend so much time in this world behind these screens isolated, seeing all the terrible stuff that the world provides us. Think about the news. The news, the daily news is like one of the most violent shows on TV. It's nothing but people getting shot, killed, wars, storms, devastation. And then they have to do a little segment. Good news for a change. Well, what happens if we demanded that people spent more time looking at the good news, the positives, the great things in life? And trust me, some of my colleagues and my uh, fellow coaches know how I'm the woulda, coulda, shoulda guy and all that kind of stuff. But I can tell you that it's an ongoing process and I'm way better than I used to be in my mindset about outcomes and seasons and, and things that went down and, and all this kind of stuff. It's so important for these kids to be able to have a setting where they know it's okay to be positive. And guess what? It's not something that just happens. You actually have to work on it. You actually have to work on looking at the world differently. And some of us, you know, it's all it's all a scale, right? Some people are just super happy and laughing and positive all the time. And some people are grumpy gusses. But we can move everybody along that spectrum in the right way. And that's why I think in every high school there should be positive psychology for these kids. And not kumbaya, feel good stuff, real proven stuff. Not like, oh, you just need to think happier thoughts. <laughs> That's not necessarily how it goes. There's a lot of skills and drills and exercises that everybody needs practice with to make them better able to navigate the life through positive rose-colored glasses. All right, last thing. We need to have a connection to past successful people. We need to have a connection to that. We have at our school, we have Olympic gold medalists. We have national record holders. We have uh, Jonathan Azu, who started his own record label, and I think is Patty LaBelle's uh, agent. Max Scherzer is the best pitcher in the, all of baseball, okay? And a lot of kids don't know that those people existed. So for a couple of years, we've had a thing called Celebrate Central. And one of the things that I wanted to do with Celebrate Central is I wanted to bring in a panel of high-achieving um, Parkway Central students who have gone on to great things. You know, and in that panel, we had SEC record holder, we had an Olympic gold medalist, we had a person who became an administrator, a person who worked for the Bill Clinton's administration and started multi-million dollar businesses, another person who was an entrepreneur that's made millions, um, a guy who is the director of art for Epic Games for Fortnite, all these people on panel. We did that one time, but that's something we should be doing all the time. And even when we can't bring those people in, like in a special panel like that, Kids should have a connection to their history. They should know the great people that came through the school, and they should meet them, and they should hear their stories, but they also should know that they once existed. Every school should celebrate all the people who've come through their building, and not every school has the same level and the same number of people. I get that. So the way that you do that could be differently. For us, you know, I'd love to see 
every one of these panels happen every year, you know, a, a different group of people come in every year and make that part of the school experience. Maybe make that something that they do at the very beginning of second semester when kids kind of need a boost, you know, to kind of push them through to the end of the year and they're not so afraid of finals and grades. And, and at the beginning of the year, it's nice, but that happens in August. And then by the time we get to May, that's been forgotten. So in the middle of the year, I think it's a good place to put it. I also think you should celebrate those people in your building. I think if you've had professional athletes come through your building, kids should see those people and see their stories and, and have a place where they can go and, and hear about their stories, whether that's digital, whether that's something they read off of a brass placard. I don't know. There's all sorts of ways that you can do it, but it needs to be happening and it needs to be happening constantly. Because like when kids go up to, like I'm a track coach, so when kids come up to the record board and they see these records, they think of those kids as being, man, that kid must have been super special and they must have been immortal. Maybe. Or maybe they were just a regular kid just like you and they just made some serious commitments to change their life to be the best that they could possibly be. Maybe they went through some of the same struggles that you had and they had a breakthrough. Maybe they met with a teacher or a musician or a coach or an employer or a family member that changed their life. And the more you realize that those people exist in your community, the more you believe you can do it as well. The more that you believe that that accomplishment isn't so astronomical that it takes a superhero to get it done. They're just like you. They just made a commitment. They made some choices. They took the opportunities and the things that they were given and they rocked it. How powerful could that be? It's a beautiful thing. And we need to do more of that. Every school needs to do more of that. Some schools do a really good job. You know, you walk into Kirkwood and you've seen every professional athlete and all the awards and all that kind of stuff. But trophies become part of the background as well. So you need to constantly be going back to that, constantly circling back to that success so that kids realize that those people are real and they get reminded frequently about those people being real and how they've improved their, their lives, either through their individual actions or the help of an educator or a teacher took the opportunities they've had. So that it doesn't become background noise that's ignored. Just like putting a sign up. If you put up a political sign in your yard, you're gonna anger 50% of the people, by the way, that you interact with. But more importantly, it's gonna be, oh, there's a sign in the yard. Who's that for? What's that politician? What's this proposition? And then after two weeks, that sign no longer stimulates you or catches your attention. So if we're going to do this connection to the past, we're going to do this connection with success. It's got to be frequent. Kids got to be hit with it all the time because you never know when you're going to catch that ignition point. And that ignition point is super important. Well, guys, I hope that wasn't too controversial for you. Um, please, 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 please share this with whoever you think this could benefit. Um, feel free to make comments. If you're any conversations you'd like me to talk about in the future or touch upon, let me know. I'd love to talk about it further. Um, if there's something you got questions about, shoot me a message. I'm always available in the summer. I'm pretty free, um, outside of, you know, my master's class and being a dad and a husband and, and doing some morning work at the cross country team. Um, but let me know. Uh, I'd really like to hear from you guys. Um, I hope that you guys have ideas as well that you think could really help schools, put those in the comments, um, share out this video. I will put this video up into some other platforms as well uh, so that it can reach out. And I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've gotten something out of this and that this has maybe at least stimulated your thought process on maybe some ideas you have that you think could help public education. But hit me up, let me know. I love you guys. We'll talk soon. We'll see you later. Bye now.